Ann and I are really pleased to have a chance to do this, to talk about the State Department, to talk about what your diplomats do, because we are public servants. We serve all governments, we serve all parties. Our goal is to advance the, the, advance the, the interests of the United States. I also want to thank Mayor Sheldon very much for inviting us to talk, because I think this is a good opportunity. Um, one of the, sort of, the, it's odd being a U.S. diplomat, because everybody's heard of the State Department. And I remember when I first joined, um, people would ask my mother, and I grew up in Rochester, um, they'd say, oh, you know, Bob's, my mother said, Bob's in the State Department. They'd say, well, how does he like Albany? <laughs> and, you know, you see you know, the State Department's on the news all the time, Secretary of State's on the news all the time, and you kind of lose track of the fact that there are roughly in the neighborhood of about, I think, 7,000 U.S. diplomats. But to put that in perspective, the total U.S. foreign policy budget, foreign affairs budget, is 1%, less than 1% of the total U.S. budget. There are more members, there are more members of US military bands. Is that working? No, she's got the lights on wrong. Oh. <laughs> Turn them off. But there are more members of US military bands than there are US diplomats. So this, you know, when people talk, oh my god, there's a huge amount of money going to the State Department. Then we should have that problem. Um, but again, what we'd like to try to do, uh, so just in terms of uh, how we're going to thought we do this. Do about 15 minutes of presentation and then Q's and A's. Because with the Q's and A's, then we can ask, we can ask what you're interested in rather than what you, we think you might be interested in. So first I'll talk a little bit about what a U.S. ambassador is, where you come from as a U.S. ambassador. Again, I'm career, was career. I joined in 1978. I got out before my entry date, which meant I was eternally 39. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have had 40 years of retirement. Um, but after we talk about that, we'll talk about Azerbaijan, what our policies are with Azerbaijan, why it matters. Because again, I will bet you, many of you have never heard of Azerbaijan. Don't worry about that. Uh, I spent an entire career with my mother saying, where is that again? <laughs> Germany and Japan were okay on um, it. So, and then Anne will talk about her role and what she did. And again, I'm emphasizing the point that diplomacy when you're overseas is a 24-7 job and it incorporates the whole of the family, and frankly, incorporates every American who's overseas. So with that, we'll start with Stephen doing the slide presentation. Um, okay, this is swearing in. This, and I was sworn in as U.S. Ambassador in February 20, 2015. It was the end of an 18-month process. Um, this is actually swearing in, this is Tom Shannon, who just resigned. He was the number three in the State Department. He just quit. Um, and this is what the State Department, this is the, the ceremonial rooms of the State Department. The Ben Franklin room. Again, the age old joke of the State Department is Franklin couldn't get confirmed these days. <laughs> but uh, you take an oath, like the president, like the military, to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And that's what you're doing. And this was right after the swearing in with the Azerbaijani ambassador, Aline Suleymanov, and we spent an awful lot of time together, and me, alone in the room, and you can see a little bit. But, once you, um, once you start this job, you're on. I got off the plane three days later, and this is it. You have, I have presented my credentials yet, this is about 10 o'clock at night after a 18 hour set of plane trips. And you have microphones shoved in your face and you're going to start talking. So, what is it you're coming from? What makes you able to do this? How do they decide you're able to do this job? Because there's not a whole lot of planning, there's not a whole lot of guidelines for what it is you're doing. And so, in my case, I grew up on the economic side of the State Department. Their State Department is basically divided into five groups. Um, the political officers, the economic, public affairs, consular, and the management administrative group. My interests, my activities were always on the economic side. So then I didn't really specialize in an area of the world, but specialized in a set of is issues, which were, as you sort of heard, trade, development, energy. 
And I sort of like that, because in a way, that's how foreign policy really affects you in the daily life. Where your gasoline comes from, where your clothes come from, how do the computers work. Those are all international activities. And it really hits every American, hits people around the world. In becoming, in sort of become, being chosen, I was asked if I was interested in doing it. I had already was basic, had been in the department at that point about 35 years, and I was sure why not, the kids were at a point where we could do that, because you kind of, kind of also figure out where is everybody going to be, where, who's going to live where, um, who's going to go to school where. Um, Matthew got two high schools, two years in Berlin, two years in Tokyo. His twin sister got three high schools, two in Berlin, one in Washington. Stephen threw a fizzy fit and refused. <laughs> So, so he got he got four years in Washington, and then he went to university overseas. So you know, don't try to do this all up. But you have to kind of balance out your family life in this, and everybody's in terms of that. So that was the timing right? Was my experience right? There's a your 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 resume, your papers are reviewed by the top levels of the State Department. They go through a list of people match up with countries. That then goes to the Secretary of State, who personally, after it's gone through the security people and the intelligence people, make sure you didn't know anything stupid. Um, that is personally signed off by the Secretary of State, who sends it to the President, who personally signs off on it. They start investigating you further. After they go through that investigation, they send your name to a foreign government that you're going to be going to, because they don't want to send, they were going to send Jim out there and form a resilient Embarrassing. Uh, it happens. Um, before a government then agrees, let's put clever French term, a Vermont. Once you get a Vermont, then the president formally announces you and your name goes to the Senate. Because the role of an ambassador is one of the few that is actually spelled out in the Constitution. The ambassadors are appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate. This is in the Constitution, not an amendment. This was right from the beginning, so it gives an idea of what the importance of the role is. After the Senate, you know, you, there's a hearing, you appear before the Senate, you talk to individual senators, Senate decides yay or nay, Senate says yes, President then attests, signs papers again, you get sworn in, and you're off. It took 18 months. So again, you don't just this is for, for a career person, you don't just do this. And they go through your security clearances, your financial records, who you contributed, who you didn't contribute to, you name it. Um, so it's an, it's, a, it's an exacting process. But once you arrive, and you get through this, your, then your, first act is to, your first official act is to present your credentials to the president. This is something you kind of get to do on your own. You're put in a car, you're driven out, in, in Azerbaijan's case, Driven out alone, review, go past the honor guard who's dressed up in the fanciest uniforms the country's got, go into the palace, you sit the guard, you go you walk to the schedule, it's good. And you, you, you walk in there X number of steps, you say certain words, you have the letters which are in sealed envelopes from the president, our president, that you give to their president. And they one recall you, they say, I'm recalling your predecessor. In my case, the morning star the earlier job at the best you, and I'm appointing Bob, Robert S. Peter, yada, yada, uh, to be ambassador, in which you then present to the president, who's of course already agreed to you in the other hall, and that makes you the ambassador. And then, in Azerbaijan's case, the two of us then go and sit down and have a first conversation. Actually, most countries, you have a, you have a first conversation. Some places, when I went with our ambassador to Berlin, when he presented his credentials to the president there, it was a more general conversation, and then they kind of kicked their way out of the room, and the president and their new ambassador, Tim Timken at that time, had a you know, more private conversation about the relationship and where they saw things going. Um, these photos, by the way, here were all taken by the Azerbaijani press. So, again, you're up, you're on, you can't screw up. Well, you can. You can always screw up. To try to minimize it, um, and you, you know, you, but you know, the, and you, again, one of the important things about being a um, American ambassador, which is different than many other countries' ambassadors, is 
because of the role of the United States, you almost become like a member that you should almost become a member of that president's national security team, where you are sort of explaining what the United States is doing, where it's going, why it's such and such is important, and trying to influence it. It's all about trying to have influence, and they know that. You know, everybody's, everybody's grown up. Um, but you're sort of working this relationship. And again, it's a human relationship. It's like a marriage. You have your good days, your bad days, things you want to say, things you better not say, things you could say, but you'll spend a long time living them down. Um, and you have to kind of work this. So, let's talk a little bit now, where is Azerbaijan? This is, but this is a question you've all been asking. Azerbaijan, is the only country in the world that borders Russia and Iran. And when I was actually in my confirmation process, I was talking to one of the senators, I joked about, hey, it's the only country that borders Russia and Iran, what can go wrong? To which he responded, what's going to go right? <laughs> <laughs> but you can see, it's on the Caspian Sea, its capital, Baku, is the lowest capital in the world. It's 30 meters below sea level. Because the Caspian actually is itself is below sea level. It's also the last remaining piece of the Tethi Sea from Pangaea, if you want to hear extra points for the true pursuit. Um, it's bordered starting on the top by Russia, but not just Russia, Dagestan, Chechnya, which, especially for people in this part of the country, remember the Boston Marathon shootings, gives you an extra sense of what's going on in this part of the world. So you've got the Russian, the Russian uh, ambitions towards this part of the world, the Russian ambitions to try to bring back the Soviet Union and Russian Empire. You've also got the Islamic extremism piece going on. Georgia is the one in which they have a good relationship with, but Georgia again has had about 20% of its territory taken away, semi taken away in terms of annexation um, by the Russians through Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Um, Armenia. Oh, by the way, this corridor, Georgia borders the Black Sea, as by John borders the Caspian. So to get from Western Europe or Europe across to Central Asia, to say Afghanistan, you've got to fly over these two. This is the only way up to Pakistan and Russia into Afghanistan. So that becomes important in a broader sense. As much as also being an oil producer. So we'll talk about this more later, but oil pipelines go across up through Georgia to Turkey and then take oil out west. As much as is Israel's largest oil supplier. But again, Russia to the north, Iran to the south, this corridor is crucial. Armenia, they've been at war for 30 years. The Armenians, because the population, it's a mixed population area in the Red Karabakh, it was a, uh, what they call it, an autonomous oblast of the Soviet Union. Armenia won, the Armenians wanted independence from Azerbaijan, it was supposed to be part of Azerbaijan. Um, the Armenians, uh, the Azerbaijanis essentially went to war back in 19, uh, 1988. And there's only reasons for the break of the Soviet Union, by the way. But the Armenians now control basically here. So again, the Azerbaijanis lost about 14 40 percent of their country. And they're constantly trying to push this back. So this is an active conflict that we're trying to help calm down. You can, right here, this 12 kilometer spit is Turkey. <laughs> so Turkey and Azerbaijan have had a very strong relationship. They're both Turkic peoples. Turkish and Azerbaijani are extremely close linguistically, but um, they have their own tensions. And a few years back, I said Turkey was a great friend and greatly helping us with Azerbaijan. Turkey was sort of the model for what Azerbaijanis wanted their country to be. With a coup attempt in 2016 and how things developed since then, it's gotten much more complicated. To the south, Iran. I would just say that two people, well, in, when I entered the State Department, there was still a Shah. Two people in my class, for those of you who saw Argo, so, um, and we've had the Iran Iraq War and so forth. So, all the complications in that relationship. So, we feel that Azerbaijan, you're talking about Russia, you're talking about Central Asia, you're talking about Iran, you're talking about Turkey, trying to prevent more active conflict here 
and you're talking about our own need to get in and out and over that part of the world. So this is what Baku, the capital, looks like. It's modern in some ways, traditional, city on the Silk Route, Caspian Sea, Maiden Tower, that nobody's really quite sure why it was built or who even built it, but it's been there for a long time. According to tradition, St. Bartholomew was, the, was, a, was martyred there. Um, it's culture, it, it's uh, parts you can go to, Gobistan, outside, just outside of Baku, where there are petroglyphs carved in the cliffs that are 30,000 years old. People have lived there a long time. So again, Baku, uh, it was built, much of this is built in the oil boom in the early, in the last part of the, of the 19th, early part of the 20th century. Uh, you see the Soviet era of apartment blocks, but then some you know, modern buildings. This church actually served as a, was a Protestant church. It survived Stalin. The promise that the people that the church made was that they would keep praying for Stalin. So they didn't destroy that. They didn't tear down the Catholic Church, tore down the main mosque. This is actually a bus stop. But it also hits the other point, which is this was part of the Soviet Union. A lot of their mindset is still Soviet. The Russian attitudes of doing things, suspicions, uh, attitudes towards the police, attitudes towards society, really formed by the Soviet era. And it hit, you know, when, the, when the wall fell, the, I remember seeing these cables would come out, the general wisdom was that we were actually posted in Vienna at the time the wall fell. The wisdom was, in five years, you won't tell the difference between East and West. Wrong. Um, you can still tell the difference. You can tell the difference in Germany which was split, and we looked at Berlin, you could walk down the street, you knew when you were in the East and when you were in the, when you were in the West. And then the mentality is still the same. It's a long process, but it's trying to, trying to sort of work through that. And again, it's still there. It's still there. It's still there. It's still there. They lost. <laughs> yeah, but we haven't necessarily won yet. So again, let's talk again, what, what is important to the United States? Why do we care about this place? One thing again is oil and gas. Um, the, your significant oil supplies. So these are pipelines that go across from Baku across to Georgia, and then you put things in the Black Sea, um, across to Turkey, and then the Mediterranean send them around. This is a new gas pipeline which I was working on that goes from uh, new gas fields they found in the, in the Caspian to um, it'll end up in Italy. It's a 40, it was 44, they worked price down, it's now $40 billion capital project. It's one of the biggest capital projects underway in the world today. But it's important in helping provide energy security, first of all, in Europe, but then for us. The idea is if you have diverse oil supplies, diverse gas supplies, you're not going to be blackmailed, you're not be able to blackmail so easily. So that was a key aspect of what it was we talked about. The other thing we do is an important aspect of what Ambassador does is promote commercial relations. We've sold something in the neighborhood of $3 billion, above $3 billion in Boeings to Ezra Chan. This is actually signing a deal with the head of the Civil Aviation Authority. Um, we sold a $240 million satellite. Um, there's lots of deals like that, one of the smallest is like $60 million in terms of farm equipment. These are all things, again, that we do as part of the, part of the relationship. The Azerbaijanis, by the way, because they're a oil country, have a lot of money for investment. And one of the things we talked about about doing was investing in the United States. Um, so again, you can sort of see, this is Baku, modern, um, sort of building up again at the same time, it's not a terribly rich country. The average uh, per capita income is about $17,000 a year. Our per capita income, our per capita GDP, is about 50000 So you get kind of a difference. You get 10 million Azerbaijanis versus 320 million Americans. 
And again, you know, the city, you have the old parts, the new, and again, library. Um, restaurants, all the things you would expect in a, in a, in a, in a modern city. The city itself is about 4 million people. The country itself is 10. So again, you see this is the view from the cast in the Maiden Tower, the traditional building for, for the turn of the last century. Now, one of the things about Asbury's now we talk about the economic relationship, we talk a little bit about the political, but one aspect of the society is its own values. It highly prizes its ethnic and religious diversity. And it's Muslim, it's Shia. It is a, the only Shia country with excellent relations with Israel. Of course, the other big Shia country is Iran. Um, so it kind of makes it very important. They, they, their tradition of Islam is important as we talk about things like fighting terrorism. Because it, again, it's kind of a soft power thing. Their example helps us in fighting terrorism, helps fight the people who are trying to recruit people who are saying, the Americans don't really like you, the Americans are anti-Muslim, and so forth. And so one of the things which we would do is, you know, visit, this, is, this mosque is actually one of the oldest of the Caucasus. Um, we would do things, this is a iftar dinner that we hosted in our house, in the residence. Um, and you have people from different religions coming together. The Asperger Center is very, very proud of that. And frankly, it's important for us as well. Again, this is a, with the, a church, um, I don't know how old it is, Caucasus, it was supposedly built by the Caucasian Albanians, which are a group of people who lived there before the, the, the Arabs came in and Islam came in in the 8th century. The Georgian church. Um, so again, a mixture of Christian, you know, a small Christian minority, uh, primarily Muslim, but the different groups living together. And again, kind of a confusion because coming out of the communist period, people aren't quite sure what their religion is or how you practice it. And the Pope's visit, um, which was kind of neat. Front row seats. Yeah, the secret is. Again, the security relationship. This is me with the defense minister. Um, the Azerbaijanis are very focused on trying to get back their parts of the Gorda Karabakh. We're interested in working with them to have the access to be able to fly over to Afghanistan to move troops and move things through to Afghanistan. Concerned about what's happening with Iraq, concerned what's happening with Russia. Uh, this is with the Marines who are part of the embassy team. They're there to protect the, the, the secure aspects of the embassy. Um, but it's an important part. And again, sort of the, the relationship, and one of the things that the ambassador is, the ambassador is the personal representative of the president. And so all, Ameri all official Americans who are not under the direct command of a combatant commander are under the, are under the ambassador. So again, the, the military plays an important role in that relationship. And this is something we're trying to show here. Can I just go back there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. So what this event is, um, is the Marine's birthday. Me and Mike. Huh? Mike. No. Well, we'll just tell the Marine's She's birthday. She's Mike. <laughs> <laughs> now, this, this is, this is every, every, the Marines um, celebrate their birthday every every November 11th. Yeah. Um, and so this is one of the ceremonies that's important at the, at the, at the embassy community is the Marine Ball, which is, come on. Um, and so this is actually, there is a whole ceremony the Marines have in terms of um, honoring the Corps, remembering the values of the Corps. Uh, and it's something, again, when the embassy comes together sort of around the different elements, in this case, coming together around the Marines. I said at the beginning, you know, one of the sort of the areas that's really important, you know, three areas are important with our relationship, the economics, the governance, the human rights, um, social aspects of Azerbaijan, and the, and the security aspect. This is down at the Iranian border. The Iranian border of Azerbaijan is a river probably twice the width of this room. Um, but 
We were deeply concerned about it because of the flow of drugs to come across it, the ability for the Iranians to get uh, components for weapons of mass destruction, to go the other way. So we had a program with them where we provided equipment for them to x-ray trucks to go through, be able to see if there's something on it that needed to be checked. And this is the this general is the head of the state border service the, of the troops who guard the border, basically our customs authority, except it's a little, it's, it's not quite the same, it's, it has a larger military component. But this is again, you know, much of what we would do is go out to different parts of the country, You're not just talking in the capital, not just talking to the president, you're talking to everybody in the country to try to reach out to them, have them understand the United States, win them over to our policies, win them over to our ways of thinking, and try to get their support. So there I went to. I'm up. You're up. I think you. I think you're. She's got a. Okay. That's just for the Speak up. So before we go to the other photos that uh, feature a lot of what I did, I wanted to stay on this photo because what's going on here, um, here I am, I'm on an official visit, which was always something that I relished doing, going with the big guy. We always traveled in these big cars. So we could really blend in well. <laughs> so we have, this is an AID representative. This is an Azerbaijani woman translator in our public affairs section. The embassy is what, 300, 400? Uh, 420 people. 420 people at the embassy. Uh, most of those are Azerbaijanis. They outnumbered us by like four to one, I think. So, 80. 70, 72 Americans and you know, 300 plus. So here's another public affairs person, Azerbaijani. These people have worked for the American Embassy for 20 years, something like that. This is my husband's personal translator behind him. You may have seen him. This is the entourage we traveled with. This is a security guard trained in the United States, very loyal to the American uh, ambassador and family, that is his job. He is part of a team. This is another one. There's another one there. I don't know how many we traveled with when we would travel, but we had at least a contingent of eight. And they were all packing. They were all our family. Uh, I dearly, dearly appreciated them. And in the very beginning when I arrived, Bob had been there for a number of months. And I arrived and I thought, this is kind of weird. Like, I can't go anywhere without these guys with me. And we did have two women. Um, but after a while, I came to really appreciate them. Uh, not that Azerbaijan, to me, looked like a dangerous country. But they were just so good at introducing Azerbaijan to me. And so we would travel in the car for four hours, five hours, and I think in this case it was about a seven hour trip. The roads weren't so good. And you get to know these people, so you're talking to them, uh, finding out about their families and so on. Um, so, so the point that they are all Muslim, was it became very, very uncomfortable for me personally, and I don't know if I should say this, but I'm going to because I have a microphone. But it was very, very uncomfortable when we would get these messages from Washington about the Muslim man. Because these, actually, this man right here, his name is Zawar. We have a holiday party. We had a holiday party every year, and they would bring their families. And so, a dinner just for them. And he said to me, Mrs. Sakuda, I will, uh, no, ma'am. I will lay down my life for you. It kind of puts chills down your spine. Um, but, but they will. And they, are, they go back routinely to the U.S. for training. Um, the department, uh, we have drivers. They, they do the training on the, on the vehicles. They never leave the vehicles. They're in the car at night when we're in the lovely five-star hotel. 
So they are on all the time. Okay, so next photo. So this is the soft diplomacy. Um, we, in cooperation with the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, a defense uh, contingent within the embassy, opened up a water treatment plant. Uh, one of the very important messages that the embassy had was empowering women. Well, you can't empower women if women are spending their entire day going up to the, the well, filling up their buckets, and going back to the house, day in and day out. So one of the ideas of the um, soft power is using the defense in, in, within the country to promote uh, humanitarian uh, efforts. That's the old water system. <laughs> so, anyway, so my husband traveled, opened up the, the, the project, and of course I was there not paying attention. I was looking at all these kids who were all, they would gather. This was a big event in the town. The American ambassador was coming with flags on the side of the car. We were coming to open up this treatment project. And so here you see all the official stuff going on. And my husband is over there, followed by Zauer and all these guards and all these Azerbaijani, very important people. Well, you know, there's Mrs. over there, like, yeah, take my picture with these men. <laughs> but they just crowded around you. And in many of, actually most of these villages where I went, I was probably the first American that they had ever seen. So the honor that we felt in, in being there um, was significant, but it was always, that Muslim ban thing was always a, a, an embarrassment. So here's one of the guys from the embassy who, um, I guess he's army? Yeah, obviously. Um, and of course my friends loved him and, and <laughs> you know, so taking pictures. But this is, you know, the background. This, is, this building right here was actually the medical center, which was pretty frightening. Okay, next picture. Um, we opened up, I was frequently asked by the AID office if I would be willing to open up a agency for international development, um, if I would be willing to open up elementary schools, medical centers in these, in these um, far remote villages. And of course I was because you get treated like royalty. And, it, and this was entree to a country that I wouldn't normally have, especially when I was traveling with my husband. I mean, I had entree, but this was me on my own uh, with no bodyguards um, and able, because I wasn't traveling with him, and really able to get in and, and you know, interact with people. So here's the school teacher. This was a, um, a kindergarten that AID uh, partially funded. And the system was AID would put up the money, um, half of the money that was required, and the rest came from the locals who would, uh, you know, they were invested in the project, and they would um, supply the lumber, they would do the carpentry. And that way we knew that this was a good project to support um, because the people were so invested in it. So um, I would usually bring toys, um, little packets for the kids, um, which they love, maybe pencils and paper. Um, the kids were all dressed up. They had, the girls all had little ribbons in their hair, um, but they were, you know, it was a big deal. So this is, this is one of the school teachers. This was another one. Uh, I was channeling Michelle Obama at that point. <laughs> uh, and there's another one. Check this out. <laughs> it was fun. It was really fun, and I, I um, really relished getting out. Uh, one of the re <laughs> one of the reasons I loved it was because they made such a big deal about us. Um, the water. I'm really glad. So this was an elementary school, and I was treated to the local dance. Uh, the students themselves were all dressed up in the national costume. And then afterwards, I would go up to uh, that stand and give a speech. One of the points I tried to make was how important education was. 
uh, we renovated this school. The, the, uh, this was an AID project. And I made a comment one time that I, was, I got such a good response, I said it a lot. Um, <laughs> education is important because you never know one of these children might grow up to become the next Azerbaijani ambassador to the United States. Oh, ha, 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 that's so funny. But one time, a mother came up to me and with, used the embassy translator and said, I really hope that that happens. And I thought, okay, we're making, we're making a difference. And so that's what it's all about. And, you know, this is why we... So I was standing here taking pictures, and the, the children are dancing. I mean, this is, what is that? I don't know. It's some Azerbaijani. Um, it's, a, it's a hat, but it's, it's used in, in festivities. Um, you know, they do these, the, the dances. Um, Stephen is actually quite good at doing the Azerbaijani dance. Um, but anyway, it's a big celebration when I would go out. Okay. Uh, yes, um, opening up, this was a, these are AID contractors, um, Azerbaijani. Uh, this is an Azerbaijani uh, translator for AID. He's worked for us for, I don't know, 10 years. Uh, opening up the uh, school, and the funny thing about this was I opened up the school and the kids were all in front of me, and the, <laughs> at the end, we start, I said, you know, the kids are all surrounding me, and, I, and the school was back there, I thought. So I was leading the kids up the road to where I thought was the school. <laughs> not with the school, and the kids were all like, ha, 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 you know, we're at the school, we're at the school. <laughs> the wrong way. Cameras are rolling the whole time. So we have, you know, the Ashburn County Police. And this, is, this is the man who was in charge of the locals, um, the construction. The, you know, the carpentry, the interior of the building. And this is the local um, head of this town, Sabirabad. So you know, he's dressed in his finest. Many, look, well, the men are on one side, the women are on the other. Um, so that was the other point that was so interesting. This was a scarf they gave me. Um, they were always so welcoming, and they were so happy that my husband had allowed his wife <laughs> to come into their village without him. Uh, they, were, they felt very honored in their culture that the, the husband entrusted his wife to all of them. So you can see there was no danger. <laughs> I was loving it. I had a great time. Um, also, what, what I was involved in was, as Mary pointed out, teaching English. Um, remembering the map, refugees come to Azerbaijan from Dagestan, from Pakistan and Afghanistan, and Iran. So these women, I had predominantly women in the class, um, but there were some men. One man, Mohammed from from Afghanistan would always, and when we would do the writing assignments, would always write how he missed his mother. And he would write, and now maybe that was because he knew the word missed and he knew the word mother. But, you know, he told me because I thought, you know, this was really very impressive. These, you know, well, um, here's the comment. And uh, so they're all different. I mean, look at this one. So we would give them lunch. Uh, and they were faithful students. They came, uh, this was twice a week. Uh, they were sponsored by UNHCR, the UN um, High Commission on Refugees. Uh, and their lives were, you know, pretty, pretty desperate when they, um, this was, you know, an activity during the day. They can't work. Azerbaijan does not give them permission to work. Um, and the English is seen as the ticket out. So I organized a class for them twice a week. So that's that. Okay, next picture. And now my husband's on again. Oh. Uh, but this was one of the trips. I'll just talk a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you. I trust the people. <laughs> this again is a trip that we made um, towards the south, and. My husband loves apple trees and has some that he has taken care of here. 
Um, this is the region's uh, forester, Azerbaijani forester. Again, our guards, the head of the guards, and we have the Azerbaijani police that, because we're here with our flags on the car, they are all going to be a part of it. And we, we drove th through the national forest with the police first, and then us. Um, anyway, looking at, looking at trees. The topography of, of um, there are eight or nine different climate zones in Azerbaijan. So you can do... In Azerbaijan, it's the same size as me. Here, you can take this. Okay. I'm just going to Okay, Azerbaijan is rough. I showed something earlier. Azerbaijan, again, is a population of 10 million people, same size as me. So you have the, uh, there are, I think, 11 different, time, uh, 11 different climate zones in the world, and um, nine of them are in there. So you have areas like this. This is off, sort of in the north. Uh, west, this is a lake that actually was formed by an earthquake back in the 13th century, but again, it's a very verb and actually remind us a lot of the people up there. Next. Uh, why don't you go back to him? No, keep going. Um, then traveling around, again, one of the traditional industry services is rug making. Um, this was a, a, a plant in Ganja. In that country, uh, Gaza, uh, on the border with Georgia, one of the, uh, one of the last places that started making the rugs traditionally. Is we went out to the Thanksgiving, um, but then they're also doing, trying to bring the industry back more in a more modern way. This is and with the, the spouses of a lot of the other other ambassadors, um, is a facility they have. But you know, when you go out in the countryside, the hospitality is really important. <coughs> And one of the ways to show the hospitality is with, by drinking, by offering tea. And we will have tea repeatedly. And it's important, again, it's respect for the, cus the culture, but it's also a way to get to know people. And, and again, as Anne said, we're very often, the, we were the first time in some of these places that they've seen in America. Um, we had a sort of running joke <laughs> with our guards. Is that one of my predecessors had been very good going to a lot of the other cities. And, we would go and we sort of asked, well, did Bryza go here? Uh, Matt Bryza was the head of the ambassador. Yeah, yeah. And then we started going to places where Bryza hadn't been. And that was our sense of real success. And the answer is, going, well, why is the American ambassador like, coming here? But it was, again, we had a good, better sense of the country as a result. And it was, frankly, it was appreciated. The president and others actually told me about that. Um, this, again, the topography, you saw that one that was very green. This is about 40 kilometers, 40 miles outside of Baku. Uh, it's a mud volcano. Um, the methane, natural gas, comes out of the ground. These were actually, you know, we thought this was the volcano. This is actually on top of the volcano. They, every, one of our trips said, you actually shouldn't be up here because these, <laughs> these mounds actually do a well. There is, as much as the largest concentration of mud volcanoes in the world. Again, you're, you're keeping track of this for the next trip of the suit night. Um, but it's sort of really wild. It's like it's like being on a sci-fi movie set. You see things like this, and this again, the kids. Um, this was actually Christmas Day a few years ago, but the methane in this one place comes out of the ground and has been burning for years. And actually, it's one of the Azerbaijan itself needs land of fire, and this was the place was holy for Zoroastrians and also for Hindus pilgrimage site for Hindus um, to come because the ground is literally, was literally burning. Now that a lot of the gas has been taken out, we don't necessarily have it so often, but it's sort of strange to be just side of this hillside is burning. Again, agriculture is important. This is roadside stand, apples, quince, pomegranates, um, and it's cold. It's in places. This is up in the Caucasus Mountains in a village uh, where one of the oldest Christian churches in the Caucasus is standing. And, uh, and the funny thing about that picture, I and our kids all have the LL Bean boot. <laughs> <laughs> and so we were going along, and that was really slippery. It was icy. And the guards 
had these things that were not LL Bean, <laughs> and they were slipping and sliding, and they kept saying, "How come you're not falling?" <laughs> you're expecting you are expecting to cut you know extra extra <laughs> extra extra. But we're hoping balls. to get for them the LL Bean shoes. <laughs> And again, this is the Caucasus Mountains. Up, this is actually up near the Russian border, the tallest mountain in the country. This is in the center of the country, but looking up, um, driving across. Um, but it's also the marsh areas. These are flamingos that migrate there. It was actually sort of fun. Was, you know, they show up in, in the winter. It's, it's sort of fun to me to actually go out and expect to see flamingos. And again, this is the uh, final picture of Baku um, in, the, in the bazaar, sort of selling, those are the hats that one guy was wearing. Um, and again, the traditional architecture, which was one of the things we really, really liked. Now, we did not do all a good job on our 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But this is, this is again us with the guards. This is yeah. sort of first time, but again, you know, these are you know guards working for the American Embassy who go up into the States and they provide more U.S. bling than I've ever seen. <laughs> um, and again, you know, you know, standing out there, you know, women, guys. This was up. This was actually up uh, up at a lake outside the second largest city in the country. So fire right away. <laughs> I'm sorry, sure, well, it's okay. It's home for us. <laughs> Could you say something about Trump Tower Baku? Um, a little bit. Um, it was a business venture that was going on when we got up there. Um, I've read the articles that were in the press, but uh, essentially, it was, I think, my understanding of it was that it was something that the Azerbaijanis had approached the Trump Organization about. And there's a long story, I can't get into it because it's a lot of commercial information that's confidential. Um, but essentially a commercial dealing was what I had understood about it. Um, but the Trump Organization had left it you know, quite a while ago. And so sort of actually, there's a reason firing the building. But it was, it, it was, um, um, so there was an Azerbaijani group that had been interested in trying to bring them in. They were bringing in a lot of, of five-star hotels at, at one point, and I think they just it was some part of that part of that package. Well, first of all, thank you very much to you and your family for the work you've done there. And um, like I guess I have a couple of questions. One, I had understood that there are career diplomats and political diplomats, and that they can be appointed, and that there was, in the, the information I had at one point was that there were a lot of political diplomats being out there. And after what you've described as what your work has been done, one, the training to do all the public relations, if you will, I can't find a better name for that right now, and all the good works it sort of worries me that there's so many people that will just be automatically assigned as a diplomat somewhere. Did everybody hear the question? Yeah. Okay. Um, and is that the truth? Is that is that does that happen? Yeah, roughly about one third. Or, I mean, it's not, I would change, rephrase it a little bit, which is about there are career diplom there are career ambassadors and political ambassadors, political ambassadors. Um, the ambassador being the head of the embassy. Um, there are roughly about a third, traditionally roughly about a third of the ambassadors have been uh, political. And this, it will change, you know, as with different presidents, different different numbers. One of the things right now, frankly, is that there are, most of our, a lot of our embassies don't have ambassadors. Um, That's what's making me cry listening to your work that yeah. you've been doing. But, and I will say, having worked for both political and career, I worked, one of the best ambassadors I've ever worked for was political. One of the worst, 
I have a referral business <laughs> career, <laughs> and vice versa. So it's, it's, it's you know, kind of individuals and, the kid and what they bring to it. But you think, like a lot of the people who are coming, there are some countries who very much like to have a political ambassador because they figure they're going to have better lives than the president. Others don't want that because they want something. You know, so it, it varies. There's 200 roughly countries out there, 198, I think. So, again, it's going to change. And may I ask one more question? Um, when I was, I was there in 89, um, before it was, when it was part of the Soviet Union. And um, it seemed that the role, I saw you with a scarf around your neck all the time. Did you wear it? Periodically, no. No. there was one picture. Whenever we went into a mosque, I would always have to put on a, a scarf, and that's me. I saw that. Right. <laughs> um, they have a pile of scarves as you walk in for all the Western women. And they're like, "What is this?" Even the don't necessarily know themselves sometimes. Right, but it's a very Western country, and and um, you know, Western dress. Yeah. In 89, when I was there, we were told not to wear sleeveless yeah. shirts or anything yeah. around the market or anything. Yeah. And, um, well, I think, I think you do take that into account. I would. Um, yeah. But when I was just going about my daily routine, I mean, no. I, I wore sleeveless a lot. And the Azerbaijani women wear sleeveless. You know, and, and yeah, it's it's quite modern. Um, in Baku, in Baku, yes, thank you, thank you. Um, when I always had a scarf with me when I would go out on these trips because it could be quite conservative. And certainly down in the south, um, very, very conservative, and the women are totally covered. And you, you'd be driving along, and the women are the are the powerhouse in a lot of the a lot of these little villages. They're out there working in the fields, and the men are you know drinking tea. And, um, but the the uh, that's why it's such a good country for AID projects to put up work um, specifically on empowering women. Because we, um, I, I met with a, a round table of, of women who all had um, careers as dairy farmer, cheese maker, uh, you know, um, uh, she was a seamstress. This woman, you know, she was making these big silk pillows and um, you know, the, their husbands were somewhere, you know, not in the village. I mean, they were maybe in Russia with another family, and they were not coming back. So this was a way of really, um, you know, in, encouraging these women. You're doing all the right things. You, you know how to work a, a dairy farm. More power to you. We want to see you successful. The American embassy coming down into these, into these villages and, and encouraging women to do this kind of work. Let me see your, your seamstress, um, or, I mean, your, your uh, sewing, and the products that you made. We had the head of the local district with us on one of these visits, and he said to me, um, you know, I want to show you. This woman is so successful. She's making these wonderful pillows. Okay, let's go see the pillows. And she's at, um, she's at a, a stand outside on, the, on a muddy, uh, well, it was, it was sunny, but it was a dusty road. And I said, what do you do when it gets cold weather? You can't work out here. And Oh, she was so happy that AID had purchased a sewing machine for her. So, um, you know, how do you work in cold weather, though? And, you know, extension cord, you know, to the out the window of the apartment. And, and she said, well, I, I don't know. I, I, I will, I'll have to bring it into my apartment, which is a one-room uh, place. And, and the man, the... the head of the district who's standing next to me said, oh, no, 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 we're going to build you a shop. <laughs> it never would have happened if we had, I mean, she'd be yeah. still out there, you know, yeah. but it, but that's the kind of, um, you know, authority and, and, you know, credibility that you bring to somebody um, who, who, you know, is just crying for attention. She can do the work, but she needs, she doesn't have the wherewithal to build a structure. And so then she got. Why did you leave, and did it have anything to do with Trump, and have you been replaced there? I just want to say that I won. 
Because she said that would be the first question. Thank you. Sorry. No, um, I was I was there three years. The usual term for an ambassador is three years. But you know, after the election, you know, we you know, and I, again, I started in '78. So I mean, I've been through transitions: Carter, Reagan, you know, Reagan, Clinton. You know, just it's part of it. I mean, what we do is we work for the for the U.S. And, the party doesn't matter. Um, but uh, when I after the after the election, you know, friends friends were talking said, "Look, you, you still got time to stay put, play the long game." Um, you know, we need people who are going to be there to provide uh, continuity, can provide uh, consistency, can help you know work things through. And they was going. Um, but I have to say that at a certain point, it started becoming more difficult um, in terms, of, again, of you know, what had worked out in the past. But also, it became difficult in the sense that we were not receiving guidance from Washington. Because again, you're not making this stuff up. You've got to be, you're trying to reflect the United States. You're trying to reflect what it is we want to do. And so it was not apparent what our strategies were, where we were trying to go with certain things. Um, I had one conversation with the president where he said, I watch CNN. So I'm like, okay, I know what you're saying. Um, and then, you know, again, you know, look at this part of the world, what it is we're dealing with. And there were things um, where, for example, the Russians were very active in disinformation efforts. And we had programs on paper where we were talking about, you know, combating that. And let's face it. I think pretty good at you know expressing you know formulating views and getting them out there. Um, the money was all blocked and Washington wouldn't come out. Again, there was very, we didn't have guidance, we didn't have resources. Spending a lot of time, you know. Again, as I said earlier, being a diplomat, being well, certainly in general, but certainly being an ambassador, it's like again you're managing a marriage. So you've got to okay, where are we going? What is the strategy? Where are we heading? And they want to hear that from us. And it simply wasn't there. And at a certain point, you sort of say, okay, this is, we know what we can. Bob, since you, uh, since you retired from the, the department, so also last week, as you would be aware, the Mexican ambassador has resigned, and the country prior to that, the Estonian ambassador. Do you foresee any other ambassadors residing and retiring in the near future, or you can't predict that? It's kind of a what, what was the question? Different. The, 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 uh, uh, the ambassador to Mexico just resigned. Our ambassador to Estonia just resigned. Um, I think different ambassadors are leaving for different reasons. Um, I don't know exactly, but I also think Roberta, who had been our ambassador in Mexico, she was also coming at the end of her time. That's something else that I saw. Jim, who was in Jim Melville, who was our ambassador in Estonia, he left and sort of made statements regarding his concern about where the administration was going on um, NATO issues. Because again, Estonia, remember Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, all had the glorious experience of being part of the Soviet Union, even though we didn't recognize it, and they don't want to go back. Um, and so, again, these kinds of things, you know, what the statements are, and when you get one statement that says, we have to really be concerned about Russia, and some other statement that goes another way, becomes really hard, and you're trying to say, what am I doing? Some ambassadors you know, left because of the end of the term, some left because of political reasons. It's just, it's, it's decisions that ambassadors are making on their own. I'm sorry. Why did you say the population of? About 10 million. About 10 million, and again, out of that 10 million, roughly 1 million were displaced, made refugees, um, out of the fighting in the Gordon Carbox. So you've got like one in ten person people are essentially refugees. And four million live in the capital. Yeah. And about two million work in Russia. So let's let's do two more questions and then uh, we can I'll get some call, call here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Please. So given their precarious or rather interesting geographical position between Shia, Sunni several dictatorships, even though, you know, Russia technically is a democracy, um, and their natural resources. How precarious is their 
ability to keep the country um, as, I don't know that stable is the right word, but as neutral or not being used in proxy wars? There's a real focus for their, for their government. They talk about following independent foreign policy. And so for them, it is a constant balancing act. Um, but in that balancing act, it's also important that we be there in a way that they can count on us. And one of the points which I kept trying to make is we're there with you. Um, and so trying to sort of underline an idea of consistency. That you know, there are certain principles in US policy that stay the same and they're again having had the experience of working with you know, both parties. Certain, you know, there are areas of emphasis that change and so forth. Um, but had been, had been trying to sort of make this point of we're with you. And this, there's two sides on that too, because you want to have them see that they're with you. So they're going to continue to listen to you and engage with you. Right. But in the case of a you know, vacuum of power or balance. Balance. Yeah. Could you say something about the Caspian Sea and, and environmental issues? Is the sea shrinking? Is there any effort to, to work on environmental issues in the U.S. I'm just involved in that? Yeah. Um, the, the Caspian, as far as, it's not like the Aral Sea, which is shrinking. Um, the Caspian has a very strange geology that is not really understood. It, it rises and falls, and apparently like on a 75-year cycle. Um, and right now it's going down, it's expected to start coming back, but nobody's really sure why. Um, but where we did have things, the Caspian had been hor horrifically polluted. Uh, one of the places where Anne went, Sumgayi, to the city on the north side of it, the, the, up here on the north side, uh, had been the center, the center for the Soviet petrochemical industry. Enough said. Um, and so it, it had a huge, incident, a huge number of incidences of birth defects, um, cancer, all sorts of things. And they've been, the government has been cleaning it up over the years. Of course, part of it too was those old Soviet industries, in many cases, just simply collapsed because there was no reason for them to return the amount of the inefficient. Um, so, there were a couple things. Um, we were working with the Azerbaijanis on uh, helping them restore the sturgeon population in the Caspian. You know, one of the things that we thought we used to get from Azerbaijan was ca uh, caviar. It is now, we actually, some of the, Azerbaijan, the guards used to talk about gallery attacks. Caviar sandwiches every day. We hated this stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it, it, was, it was plentiful. It is it now. Um, and so they're trying. One thing there's actually a fisheries uh, hatchery down in Florida, um, you know, it, which has been. They have been sort of helping develop sturgeon eggs, and, and so sort of they ship the, the eggs over to Azerbaijan. We just just had the first successful transfer of these eggs, where they, they not only got the eggs over, which we've done in the past, but they had been transported right. Um, awkward moment. Um, <laughs> but this is the last one, we got them transported right, and the, and the, and the, and the, the eggs have hatched, and the hatchlings are doing well. And there's actually a thing that the embassy just put up on its Facebook page, or embassy page on that. So we're working on that. Um, one of the things Ann and I tried to do was hit all the national parks. We spent a lot of time just sort of trying to develop interest in, in the nature of the country. Uh, something the embassy did was they sort of periodically go out and help clean the beaches. You know, just do a plastic pickup. Plastic bags, you know, would sort of be going all over trying to pick that kind of stuff up. So we worked with the government, worked with citizens' organizations in the country to sort of learn to respect the environment. And it's something, again, that the people wanted. I mean, they appreciate the beauty of the country, and they, they want to protect it, but they weren't quite sure how. And there's also, again, the kind of an attitude sometimes where people say, oh, well, that's the public, so I don't need to worry about that. Whereas for us, it means public means I do have to worry about it because I'm part of the public. So that's, again, part of those mentality things that are going to have to change over time. Okay, time. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>